So welcome to our last session here in the year, the GDTA Powwow. I am welcoming people from all around the world and I'm really happy that we can do three experts and multidisciplinary experts uh, from our recently joining member, uh, the Shankar uh, University College uh, for Engineering, Design and Art. And I loved uh, your, uh, I love that from the very beginning, this uh, very strict combination of things which you usually would separate and keep it in different, in different silos. Now uh, you were putting this together. And uh, I think that is one of the reasons why we had a, we, we were from the very beginning, very open to um, associating you as a member. So, um, and since you are cooperating with other universities since years, um, and also a part of the Sugar Network, which um, I'm welcoming here as well. I think they are also this week, they had some events going on as well, um, also around the planet. I'm um, happy to uh, greet now uh, Dr. Asaf Krebs, um, the uh, co-director of the Design Factory Shank Shank Shankar, uh, and uh, Dr. Yigal David, the co-director of the Design Factory as well. Um, and uh, they are from different perspectives. Um, uh, Asaf is from the more design perspective and uh, Yigal more from the business perspective. As I learned, you are uh, a long year entrepreneurship. You are from the uh, telecommunications industry, but you'll probably talk about yourself uh, in a bit. And Daniel Altman, who is the official representative of Schenkar uh, at the Global Design Thinking Alliance. Uh, welcome, Daniel, again. And you are, you told me you are more on the administrative side. Uh, you are uh, trying to support the leaders of Schenkar, um, help them to move into the right direction. Um, uh, the direction is already on a very good path, I, th I think. And I'm looking forward to hear from uh, all three of you. I think Daniel will start, we'll give it a start and give us a little introduction on uh, what Shankar is and how it's um, at your place. And then uh, you will move over and you do the moderation of the three of you. And then we go back and the whole setting is uh, like we like in the last time. So we'll have about 30 to 40 minutes of presentation of, uh, it says 4 p.m. I think it's, Steffi? Yes, it's 5 p.m. It's 5 p.m. Okay, I was just a little bit irritated because my clock is saying. I won't. <laughs> 5 p.m. <laughs> So we have a 40, uh, 40 minutes, uh, a 30 to 40 minutes presentation, and then it's the floor is open. During the presentation, I would like to ask you to switch off your videos so to make sure that we just see the presenters. But after the presentations, uh, we would love to see all of you and to get you in touch. This is the where we don't do that in a webinar mode. We do it actually in an open Zoom call mode. Uh, to make sure that we get all the chance to discuss with each other, to share, to learn. And uh, it's uh, always, uh, I ask you also, please uh, use the chat also in between. Steffi Schwertfeger, who is uh, supporting, uh, is always supporting to set up the meeting. She will check in the back also the incoming uh, questions and recommendations on the on the YouTube channel. We are recording the session. We are streaming it live on YouTube as well. And we make it also accessible later on the gdta.org website. For those of you who have to step out earlier, but I would love to see more and more also coming in and joining the discussion here in the Zoom call. Uh, so I hand over now to Daniel, uh, thank you very much for giving us an introduction to Shankar College. So please welcome Daniel Altman. Thank you very much, Uli and Stephanie and the whole team. Uh, I'm really excited to be here tonight. So uh, first of all, happy Hanukkah to everybody. So it's the sixth candle of ha Hanukkah, uh, which leads me to be Israel, the startup nation, uh, which everybody knows. So I want to share one ingredient about what makes uh, Israel the startup nation, uh, chutzpah. 
And uh, I'm gonna explain chutzpah through my personal story at Shinkar. And as Uli said, uh, my story was, I started at Shinkar in 2014 uh, as a young individual, uh, quite a hippie, looking for a good career. And uh, Shinkar, engineering, design, art, as Uli uh, explained, sound, sounded for me like the best place to go. Uh, and how, and the best way for me to fulfill myself as a young individual. But then in 2015, like many young people, when I got into academia, I was a bit disappointed. And the reason was these dots between engineering, design, and art, I found them to be walls. And I found that the, the, the faculty members uh, don't really engage to each other as much as you would expect if this is the name of the institution. And I was even more surprised that the students were not looking and engaging into these kind of conversations. So together with a good friend of mine from software engineering, I was from industrial engineering, we started a community called DOTS because that's the way we saw it. We saw the whole of Shinkara's DOTS that we just need to connect together. And we started making meetups and communities and one thing led to another, but it was all about doing. And we didn't ask any permissions and one thing led to another. I graduated my bachelor's degree and the president of the college offered me to join to the dark side. Uh, and then I became a part of the uh, management, which then I found people like Mirav Peretz and Igal David here that were crazy enough to join me in any way that we thought that we can combine uh, these two worlds together. So we joined the Sugar Network, as some of you may know. We joined the Design Factory Global Network, and we're very proud to be the new members of the Global Design Thinking Alliance as well. And if you can see, all of these shared the common, uh, I would say, knowledge of connecting the dots, which is exactly what I hope you're going to see tonight that we can do, that we like to do, and uh, enjoy your evening. I'm here to answer any questions in the end. So I hope my story is a bit of a glimpse into the Israeli chutzpah. Uh, it's my pleasure to transfer the screen to Asaf Krebs. Thanks, Daniel, uh, for this lovely presentation of Shankar. Uh, let me just make it into a presentation mode. Um, right, so um, just before uh, we start, let me briefly introduce myself. So I have learned visual communication in Beit Salev, which is an Academy of Art and Design in Jerusalem. And I spent a big portion of my career as a senior and art director in one of the world's largest international branding companies. So it took, me, it took me a while to realize that what I'm doing might be profitable to the company, but it certainly doesn't fit into my own view of design and social and ethical perspectives. So I therefore made a cut in my life, and please remember that word as we'll get back to it very soon. And I completed additional three degrees in classical studies. And today what I'm doing is I'm a senior lecturer in the unit for interdisciplinary studies at Shankar. And like Daniel said, I'm also the co-director of Design Factory Shankar. And I'm telling you all of that not to boast, but because I hope that by the very end of this talk, you'll be able to connect these dots, these different dots of my life, the practice and the theory and you know, the design and the history and the education and business. Mm -hmm. And I hope that you will be able to understand why it's relevant to design thinking. Um, so please let me briefly uh, uh, cut into the two arguments I wish to just uh, demonstrate today. So the first one is that design leads to obedience and to lack of creativity. And the second one is that design leads to disobedience and to creativity, namely the very opposite view. So just before we start, I believe that everyone here heard the name of Marshall McLuhan. So it was McLuhan about 50 years ago, drew our attention to the fact that technology is not a transparent or objective medium as we conventionally used to believe. In fact, what McLuhan argued is that the thing is exactly the opposite. Technology is a medium that changes us, changes us as human beings and it alters our society. And since technology is always a part of our culture, in, we, in the culture where it was created, so of course, in our culture as well, we are facing an endless circle 
where we create technology that changes us, and this change initiates the creation of new technologies, and so on and so forth. Design, needless to say, follows the exact same path. It is not an innocent or aesthetic medium, just as I thought when I finished and graduated the Bezalel, but rather it's a powerful tool and it is able to change us as individual and society as well. So how, how, how does change in technology and society actually happen? There are numerous answers to that, but I'd like to use Thomas Kuhn's explanation. So here you can see also Thomas Kuhn in Hebrew, for those of you who doesn't know Hebrew. So Thomas Kuhn was a philosopher of science and he argued that science changes not through a linear process of development, but rather in the form of paradigm shifts caused by break and continuity. We will talk more about break and continuity later, but for now, let me just say that it is my view that design thinking have the power to introduce such a paradigm shift and that this is exactly what the world needs right now. So first, let me start by a short example that illustrates how design is related to obedience and to lack of creativity. So some of you may recognize the figure on the left. This is Louis XV. The guy on the right, however, is probably less familiar. And this is Robert Francois Domien. And he tried to assassinate Louis XV. And unfortunately for, his, for him, he failed. And it is unfortunate because his punishment for the assassination attempt was as follows. He was to be taken and conveyed in an open cart wearing nothing but a shirt, holding a torch of burning wax to the Palais de Grave. So it's like a very big uh, um, circle in uh, Paris. There on a scaffold erected, his flesh was to be torn from his breast, arm, thighs and calves with red hot pincers. His right hand was to be burned with sulfur and on those places where the flesh was torn away, molten lead and boiling oil were to be poured. After that, his body was to be drawn, quartered by four horses, and his limbs and his body consumed by fire, and so on and so forth. Excuse me for those details, they are important. Because now today, this might be for us a bit radical, maybe not so ethical punishment. But why? Why do we think so? What has been changed? So let's jump a century ahead to the beginning of the 18th century. And this is a prison that we know in this, I think it's a prison in Britain. So the prison protocols of design describe a day of nine working hours, getting up at five and staying most of the day in total silence. Prisoners are to be taken to jail in closed carriages so no one can see them and they are to remain locked until they serve their time. These two examples are brought together not only by me, but they have been brought by Michel Foucault in order to illustrate a remarkable change that happened between these centuries. While punishment in the 18th century was public and horrifying, a hundred years later, it was silent and hidden. Furthermore, instead of punishing, in, in, instead of punishment that was executed on the body, the new punishment method was directed towards the soul. But the change, says Foucault, is not at all a sign of progress or even not of better moral ethics. Rather, it is just a transformation of power system. If obedience in the 18th century was driven by fear from external, oh, sorry, you are not supposed to see this slide yet, but I will get to it. So if obedience in the 18th century was driven by fear and external and physical factors in the 9th century, it was governed by initial, by, by internal discipline. So now we are getting to the question, why the hell are you telling us all that? So stick with me one more minute. I will tell you why, I, I'll get to it, I'll tell you why. But uh, let's see first what caused this change in the form of power. So according to historians, this, this change, this shift is related to transformation from monarchy to nation state that took place at the time and required a change in the structure of the power. If I'm a king, the easiest way for me to rule is to force my citizens to obey by intimidation and threat. In this system, it is fear that, cre that creates discipline, hence the need for brutal punishment in the city square. However, in nation states, where I have millions of citizens and a more democratic governance, it is not so useful to cut the head of anyone who does not obey the rules. There is a much more sophisticated solution for that, 
And this solution, according to modern thinkers, is by educating them to control themselves. If we teach people to follow norms, they will learn to be obedient from their supposedly own free will. And this will make management and administration of the state very easy. Now let's go back to the other question. How the hell is that related to design? And the answer here is in a very straightforward way. So the most acceptable explanation to how we create obedient, normative and disciplined individual is through the metaphor of the panopticon that I'm sure you've heard of already. This term came from a type of prison designed by Jeremy Bentham in the 18th century. And the design enabled controlling prisoners by implementing in them the sense they are potentially being watched all the time. The modern form of the panopticon is of course the technology of surveillance camera. And it has found its most extreme form in China. So it is well known that recent, in recent years, China developed a credit system that creates not money, but rather human beings by giving them points for good or bad behavior. The system is designed as a tool for evaluating individuals in various aspects of their lives. Smoking in public, crossing a busy road, I don't know, delaying, delaying returning your bicycle, your rental bike. All of these are carefully documented in millions of surveillance cameras that have the technology today of identifying faces. Once you were documented by a camera breaking a desired norm, you are punished by losing credit points. And these have serious implications, of course, because these points control numerous aspects of everybody's life. And they di dictate almost everything from the right to live in a certain neighborhood to the permission to use public transformation. So indeed, it has always been a great challenge of Chinese rulers to control their enormous nation. And the current norm of power is provided to them by modern technology. And it is this technology that creates the, the citizens as disciplined individuals. If they choose not to obey, they are exposed to public shaming. I couldn't bring pictures here because, pictures here because I don't have rights, but just look in the, into Google, just Google it and you will see People are, they are screened all over the city if they are committing offenses. And this is already a technology both that uh, respond because we already said that technology both creates culture and respond to it. So this is a developed technologies that projects other face on your own face in order to deceive the cameras. Technology, of course, you know, that. This, this kind of technology that can identify faces have other implications. And one of the most striking of them is the algorithms. So here's a post that was circulated in the internet a while ago. A guy took a picture of himself with his girlfriend. As always, Google algorithm quickly tagged the picture as it does in many cases. Of course, you can see his skyscrapers, airplanes, cars, everything, but he decided that the image of the girl is that of a gorilla. And this is the post that was on Facebook. Is it possible that the fact is most of the algorithm developers are white and male, is that related? Probably yes. Indeed, it is well known that there is not only a race bias, but also a gender bias in algorithm. So if you are a black female and a crime has been committed in your local supermarket, there's a good chance that you, will, you would be fine yourself at the police station because the algorithm failed to correctly recognize the black feminine face. Now, it should be stressed that the panopticon is not only about cameras or algorithm. In fact, it is all over, usually in forms and places we least, we least expect. Okay, it might be easy for us um, to locate it in places like open space and work or in the university, the architecture of school and universities where the structure also, also suggests that everyone is re replaceable, right? So the lecturer, the students, everyone is replaceable. A bit less obvious example is the modern apartment design that eliminates the former classic separation between the kitchen and the living room, creating a panoptic space where the parents can constantly watch their kids. So it's not, it's, it's not that innocent as it may look like. And if it is hard for us to imagine any other design of apartment, it might be a sign for the depth of norm and conventional thinking we are experiencing rather than the possible existence of other forms. 
So in a small literary experiment that the French writer Georges Perec wrote, he asked what, what happened if we would build apartments not or like rooms, not according to the functions, like a room for sleeping, a room for eating, a room for bathing, but what would happen if we would create rooms according to days of the week. So a room for Sunday, a room for Monday, and a room for Tuesday. So this was just a very short demonstration of how design and technology have the potential to turn us to obedient non-creative individuals. But let me turn now to the more optimistic view of how design can create in subordinated individual and initiate creativity. And let me start by a very quick spoiler right away. This can be done, that is, this is what I think, by design thinking. However, Within the domain of design thinking, I wish to direct our gaze to a very specific part or rather space of the model. So the classic model of design thinking refers to several anchor points or dots, which generate the process, but they generate a very specific movement. We are looking at a linear process of progress of cause and effect or of purpose and solution. This of course seemed to us very natural and very logical, but it is only natural because this is how Western thought has been designed since the days of Plato. So the platonic tree-like structure that governed Western thought for the last 2000 years drew a linear line that leads from causes that can sometimes be hidden like, like tree roots to effects, which may be visible like the branches of the tree. In this vertical way of thought, the seed always grow in one direction to become a tree. The past always leads to the future. Modernism leads to postmodernism and progress means moving from less developed state towards a more developed one. While this structure might be true, it is certainly not the only one. In fact, as we know from quantum theory and later from network theories, the platonic model misses a huge part of reality. And while the platonic model is a tree-like structure, the network model provides us with a different grass-like logic. Instead of linear vertical growth, grass spreads horizontally and surfacely and moves to all directions randomly. And this kind of behavior necessarily provides a different logic structure and different perception. It suggests movements rather than fixed concepts. It, it challenges notions of linearity of progress. It allows multiplicity rather than unity. Indeed, as Thomas Kuhn said, in reality, progress is not linear process and paradigm shift does not follow any straight lines. So if we wish to generate creativity and bridge boundaries, we might want to look at a model which challenges the platonic one and a superficial rhizomatic structure might offer us some interesting groups. This is why for me, the real promise of design thinking does not lie in the five steady anchor dots that points at a certain direction, but rather in the unexplored vibrant spaces between them. And in order to explain how can these spaces can provide different outcomes, I'd like to briefly mention three concepts taken from a different discipline. And these are the concepts, Kaisura, the analytic third, and the skin. So let's start with the first one, Kaisura, one of the most interesting models of thinking through gaps is the synaptic model of the Indian British psychoanalyst Wilfred Bion. So a synapse is a word originated from ancient Greek and it means connection. A synapse is, a, is um, I'm sorry, today we are used to describe a space between two, two nerve cells with synapse. And this space, through, through this space, there are electric signals which are moving. The synaptic model refers to this connective space, which Bion calls kaisura as a metaphor for continuity and connection between separated states and conditions. So kaisura is the, is, the, is the Latin word for cut and in Latin poetry, and here I thank my classical education. So in Latin poetry, it expresses a short break in the middle of a line, which creates a pause in reading. And at the same time, it functions as part of the line's musical flow. Of course, we know Kaisura is not only from Latin poetry. Freud himself mentioned our very first Kaisura, that of our birth. 
the dramatic Kaisura, this, you know, the birth dramatic uh, Kaisura marks both the cut and the con continuity of our existence between the life inside the womb and outside of it. The idea of Kaisura allows Bayan to think of a break that produces continuity altogether. It serves as a model for possibility to cross other Kaisuras of continuity it between allegedly disconnected domains, such as past and present, body and mind, experience and interpretation. So going back to my own life, as I mentioned at the very beginning of my talk, what seemed to be a sharp Kaisura, a sharp cut between totally disconnected disciplines of design and classical studies turn out to be a Kaisura. It is that space of in-between that allows me today to move between theory and practice, or so between design object and ideas, or between design and design thinking. The Kaisura between the dots in design thinking are for me promising spaces of continuity through zone of un uncertainty. It enables transformation of obstacles and connecting allegedly separated domains. So the second term I mentioned is the analytic third. And it is a, a different uh, way to look at spaces of in-between. And it was developed by a psychoanalyst as well, whose name is Thomas Ogden. So Ogden uses this term to designate the therapeutic process created in a conceptual space between the therapist and the patient. The therapy according to Ogden is not an individual occasion that happens solely in the patient's mind or also it does not take place only in the therapist's own head. It is a joint creation shared by both sides and it happens in a virtual and third analytic space that allows both of them to come into being. In other words, the third analytic is a medium where the process of healing, creation and development happens. Finally, I'd like to connect the dots of our lecture title and to refer to the third and last metaphorical concept, the skin. So I forgot to tell you that my PhD thesis was about the skin and this is my main research area. And I'm talking about skin as a metaphor. So, as I've said before, challenging the tree-like Western thinking model can open new creative and critical ways of being in the world. And I'd like to suggest that instead of grass, we can use the skin as an alternative model for the platonic one. These slides show human skin, but keep in mind that everything in the world is covered with skin. And this is true also to dig digital interfaces and design objects. Therefore, the skin for me is an excellent space to, to explore. So the skin is a complex paradoxical surface. It is both sealed and permeable, dead and alive, opaque and transparent. It faces both the inner body and the external world. Like Janus, the Roman bounded fa double-faced god that looks simultaneously to the future and to the past, the skin functions as an in-between platform that connects our past to our present. Just think, for example, on a scar that inscribed a past wound on your present skin. So the skin constantly creates new encounters and connections with its surroundings and it reacts and interacts. In fact, in contrast to our intuition, the skin is not even a border, rather it is a frontier and there is a big difference between the two. Because while a border is a fixed delimitating outline that separates things, a frontier is ambiguous polysemic space in which there, uh, there is a constant struggle between opposite factors. If we employ Kitanius thought on design thinking, it can help us to challenge the inherent linear and logic process. We can remain polysemic and ambiguous rather than objective oriented. We can employ paradoxes, inconsistency and multiplicity. Thinking through the skin enables us not to choose between options, but rather to be everything and to be everything at the same time. It allows us to become an intermediating membrane, a formless form. The skin is the layer that on the one hand separates us from the world, from the rest of the world, but on the other hand, it allows us to touch the world and to touch it, each other, to interact, to feel, to connect. So if you're asking me, this is exactly what good design thinking can and should be. And that has been for me, and I am now passing it over to you, Igal. Thank you so much, 
Uh, so that is fascinating. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, um, I'll just put on my, um, my presentation. Okay. So, um, I'm very happy to be here with you tonight. Um, and um, I will share with you my uh, personal uh, journey. Uh, and I will try to connect the dots between 1997 and today uh, from my personal professional uh, perspective. So um, just a few words about my personal uh, background, professional uh, background. Uh, if I may sum up uh, my career, I would, I would say that I was acting three times as a VP uh, in the telecom in industry, uh, VP strategy for, uh, um, um, for a few years, uh, VP R&D research and development and VP product development, all of them, uh, I've, I have made for uh, mobile operators. Uh, and also I was acting twice as a CEO, uh, once for a software company uh, doing speech recognition uh, solution, uh, and once for uh, the second largest ISP in Israel. Um, so in the last two decades, I was uh, focused in voice analysis uh, as a main research domain. And, and it has been playing uh, a dominant role in several domains, actually, uh, the voice an, uh, analysis engineering practice. So let me start in uh, 2000, uh, sorry, in, uh, in uh, 1997, uh, where the application, the main application for uh, voice analysis uh, was voice signature. Uh, we used to um, use uh, or deploy um, engineering practices and methods only, actually it was only engineering and, and uh, uh, practices and methods uh, uh, where the application was to, uh, uh, to try and, and embed uh, uh, for the hands-free kids uh, ordering system. So uh, just like you do with Siri and Alexa today, uh, we used to do it in, in cars in Israel. So uh, the mission was to make sure that the authentication is, is, uh, is valid, that, that when someone talks to, uh, uh, to, the, to the system, that the system recognizes him. Um, so uh, those uh, methods were involving uh, uh, fundamental frequencies detection, uh, resonance uh, fr uh, frequency uh, um, uh, analysis, uh, voice clarity. Uh, we used to train the engine uh, with uh, data sets, but only limited data sets because uh, the system was limited at the time. Uh, we used to classify whether uh, the, the talker is the talker indeed or not. It's a kind of authentication. Uh, it's, it's like a footprint or a fingerprint. It was a one-to-one -one, uh, result. Yes or no? In 2003, I, uh, I moved uh, to another uh, company uh, uh, doing uh, speech recognition for speech to text. And, and that was again driven by uh, economical uh, uh, considerations, business considerations. We want to archive, we wanted to archive uh, service records. So uh, archiving voice records were, was rather complicated. So uh, we, we actually swapped uh, the speech streams into text and then we could uh, archive it as text and then we could uh, recall it uh, uh, more easily by uh, typing uh, a search, searching word or something like that. Um, so then again, it was an engineering driven uh, application using algorithm uh, engine. Again, we had to uh, analyze uh, uh, phonemes. Uh, we had to identify them. We had to use dictionary. 
we had to use um, uh, syntax for uh, sentences analysis. Uh, and of course, we had to use some statistics uh, in order to predict uh, which, phonemes, which phoneme comes uh, after what phoneme. So we, we used to use some likelihood analysis as well uh, as a part of uh, the methods that uh, we use. In 2006, uh, I actually joined uh, SpeechView, uh, which was a speech recognition uh, company doing an application that swaps uh, speech stream into lip sync, animated lip sync. So in the first place, we did, we did it for the assistive uh, technology market. Uh, we aimed the product or the application for uh, the hard of hearings and the, the deaf. Uh, it has to be very precise. We couldn't uh, make it rough uh, because the information was crucial for the user. And then we realized that maybe we can spin it off to the entertainment market by, um, by using this engine uh, for animation, 3D animations. So of course, we, we didn't aim to replace uh, uh, Pixar or electronic arts, uh, but uh, when, when those movies came to Israel, for example, which is a non-English uh, um, uh, speaking country, uh, then the adaptation, uh, the adaptation of voice and uh, animation, you it could be much easier if we use an, a kind of uh, um, uh, technological tool. So this is this was actually the first time that the the engineering driven uh, uh, methodologies involved um, kind of design um, uh, capability. Uh, in 2012, um, I moved to another company, another um, uh, telecom company, ISP. And then um, we decided to realize in our um, call center whether the sentiment is positive or negative, um, uh, whether, um, uh, whether, uh, uh, whether the talk around our brand is is, is, is good or bad. Uh, so um, uh, we used, uh, we used uh, machine learning algorithmic uh, methods in order to classify um, bad calls, what we used to call, in order to, to maybe to do some other steps uh, um, uh, following uh, those uh, bad conversations. Um, but you know, uh, we, we were trying to understand, this kind of analysis is, is rather complicated because it's not like a speech to text. It's not only speech to text. Because if, if I say to you, um, he's a, such a wise guy, it's a kind of positive approach. But if I say to you, oh, he's such a wise guy, it's not very positive. It doesn't sound very positive. So we had to analyze frequencies again in order to um, make sure uh, whether the, the sentiment is good or bad. In 2015, and this is my final milestone, I submitted my doctorate uh, uh, work uh, at Middlesex University of London, um, where we analyze voice sentiment for emotion detection, which is not only uh, engineering-based uh, 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 idea, but it involves uh, software uh, domain of science, uh, such as uh, uh, socio social biology or, or human behavior, um, uh, some Darwinistic, Darwinistic uh, approaches like the frequency code, how animals communicate with one each other, uh, how, how it's got to do with uh, uh, the, evolu the, the evolution of, of human being, how voice can, can create uh, some advantages uh, over other rivals, like in attraction or confidence or rel reliability, uh, uh, of course, perception-wise. Um, and then uh, we, uh, I, I, I had made this uh, uh, research to understand how the voice of, uh, um, of uh, call center representative affect 
the, the customer experience of our uh, um, consumers. So just quickly, I would like to share with you um, the, the results. Um, actually, what we discovered there, that if this access is, is the customer experience, which is, which is yeah, how, how the customer feels, and this access, the X access, is the level of service, the objective level of service, how the organization operates, um, we could argue that usually it has to be linear. The customer satisfaction level has to be linear. Because if, we, if you got lousy uh, service, then you're not, you're not happy. And if you, get, if you get a good service, you, you, you're supposed to be very much happy. But in, in reality, we found out that in some cases, people got really not, not very good service, but they were rather happy. Uh, and in some cases, they got really good service and they were unhappy. And those hidden areas are, 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 are in fascinating for us, were in fascinating for us, and we decided to, to further um, explore them. And that's what we did in our research. And, and we found quite interesting um, uh, insights related to uh, voice speech, uh, the frequency pitch of, of the speaker, uh, the voice clarity, uh, the speech rate, uh, and, and other, uh, other, um, um, other aspects. So actually, my research yeah, from, from the beginning went from some engineering uh, or only engineering uh, driven uh, product development into a software domain that involves um, um, more uh, design uh, thinking, um, uh, um, UX, customer experience. I would like just to go back to, to my previous slide and show you the, um, sorry, not, not here, sorry, yeah. I'm, like to go to this slide and show you just this is my my very last one uh, to show you my uh, my journey in the last two decades as I see it so from only engineering we moved into uh, a kind of um, um, based on engineering but but mainly design uh, uh, applications um, just just a quick look. Uh, on the image source here, this is it's this uh, image is taken from the collective UX uh, voice design, the future of UX. It means that in 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 the reality where Alexa is taking over, and uh, Siri and uh, OK Google is 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 a kind of legitimate tool for input. We have to make a lot of effort to improve uh, um, the user experience. And the design is a major part of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Egal. Thank you very much, Daniel and Asaf, uh, for your uh, presentations and inputs. Uh, very, very valuable. And uh, welcome here to the community. Uh, and I think. Uh, there is some food, some uh, food for thought, uh, a lot of food for thought, and especially, let me just react. Uh, maybe first, um, we we started. I uh, now I I I ask now. I please switch on your camera again. Um, all of you who want to participate, we uh, you're happy to switch on your camera. Um, and uh, the discussion we were uh, going into in August at our conference, our GDTA conference, about ethically and value-based design as uh, one of the, the core future orientations of the design thinking community, I think you are addressing from different perspectives exactly uh, those issues which are concerning a lot of people right now and there is a, a, a huge and deep need for uh, rethinking also the the way of engine pure engineering this kind of technical driven engineering and i like the uh, yigal your your waves your your uh, the last uh, 
uh, graph you were showing, and uh, I think that is an indication for something. Yeah, we're 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 tipping on something, and then we find out. Oh no, it's uh, it's just just a, then we are in the in the in, in a deep <laughs> the deep valley again, and we have to uh, find the find the new ways. So um, yeah, that was uh, actually very very helpful. I just saw uh, Mert Aro also. Uh, uh, arriving i think he is i hope he is still around from estonia which i had the chance to to talk to you yesterday matt are you still there hello ah yeah yeah i see you there okay uh, great yeah, you were you were saying there is a quite philosophical discussion which you probably didn't expect here in the global design thinking alliance <laughs> but, but the the floor is open so please uh please questions ideas from all of you. Maybe Mert, if you want to start. That's always a, a great starting point. Um, so <laughs> <clears throat> pleasure to meet everyone and um, greetings to Israel. Uh, you, you have so, so much better weather than we have at the moment. Um, so we, we envy you. Um, but uh, I really enjoyed uh, quite a few. Uh, I mean, philosophical discussion is always a great thing to do. And uh, especially like looking at how design uh, uh, creates um, like uh, human behavior uh, as well and how, how we feel, of course. Um, uh, I, I really enjoy it. Uh, if we talk about education development, um, some years ago at uh, World Econ uh, Education Summit, um, I saw a Danish uh, designer team that um, had looked at um, various um, ways how humans naturally have been used to learn and and have designed uh, concepts uh, in education space development because of that and um, uh, especially um, fascinating i found uh, the idea that if you if you put students in a cave like environment uh, then how, how they start feeling and and what kind of things it would be practical to learn in this kind of environment and and um, and now if you try to imagine yourself uh, in, in, a, in a closed environment uh, where, where you're kind of safely surrounded by, by the rocks and, and you have nothing to worry about, like how you feel when you, when you discuss something or, or how you'd learn there. And another one that they had was the fireplace where, where students were sitting in a round around the fire and it was mostly kind of good for the storytelling. Uh, so... If you're curious about this, I, I can try to find um, uh, the information about that. Um, but um, yeah, this this was one of the thoughts that I, I had when when I listened to, to to one part of the whole discussion. Yeah, that would be great. It's very interesting to see those things. Actually, I can tell you that I just um, we had like a very big project. Uh, actually, not with in par, but with other students, and we need, we were asked to design new. Um, educational system, new educational um, environment, technological educational environment for a um, very, um, let's say, challenged school in Jerusalem. So schools of um, people with a lot, with lot of problem, uh, schools in very low uh, socioeconomic status uh, neighborhoods and so on and so forth. It was very interesting to see how the very design of the platforms, of the classes, of the chairs, of the uniforms, whatever, everything is so crucial when you come to education. So it's quite amazing to see that. Right? You wouldn't think it matters so much. So I'd love to see that, yeah, if you have this research. I will find it. Great. Is that Nadia? I was seeing Nadia Witte. You, you were. Oh, Natalie. Her hand. Her hand. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks, everybody. I really enjoyed that as well. Um, Asaf, have a question for you or anyone on the call if, if uh, you feel like sharing. I was really intrigued and uh, appreciated your idea of design unthinking. And your explanation and interpretation of the caesura, you know, in this kind of rational process that we might have with design thinking, which 
you know, can kind of feel linear at times. Um, and I'm wondering if, if you might have any ideas about how we can integrate these, these breaks, these uh, caesuras in order to integrate more empathy, more maybe emotional type thinking that ultimately helps us serve people or provide products to people. And I was thinking of the Stolpersteine, I think maybe people on the call who are in Europe might know this better than me being in Canada, but speaking of space and, and using space to, to jar you and, and, and stop you in order to learn something new, um, these, these stones in Europe that tr literally trip you or stumble you into to learning about history of the Holocaust. I'm wondering if you can think of any design thinking or design or classical ideas that we can use to kind of embed and integrate purposeful caesuras into our design or other work. Wow, so thank you, Natalie. This is a, an excellent question and a really good, a really good uh, question. So, <laughs> and very challenging one, I have to say. So as, as Uli said, this seems to be a highly philosophical, um, let's say lecture or what uh, words, but I don't really think it is so philosophical. I think we are doing it. It is very practical for me. So I was like trying to shrink a book that I'm writing with a couple of hundred of pages into 15 minutes. That's why it is very, very concentrated and I couldn't give uh, any examples. But I mean, just, you know, let's have very decide, decide, for example, from Western thinking to Eastern thinking. So if, for example, you, you, we would take Buddhist thinking, um, so they offer, uh, they offer us practices where they analyze the perception and the causes of our behavior in a very, very um, sharp way and they provide us with a manual of how to do it different. So for example, they have like this uh, four noble truth or there is the eight for uh, eight fold path, which is about uh, right view, um, right concentration. So I'm, I'm introducing it not because we have time now to elaborate on that because it is also very, very big. But I think if we avert our gaze from those points, from empathy and from, because you know, the, the whole process is designed as a platonic logical tree. You have a problem, you need to solve it. There is a route to go through. And this is how we work in that. And it's not that it is wrong, but in this way, we miss so much because we are not allowing ourselves to look outside. So what I'm trying to do with my students is not to focus on these points. So I introduce them the points and I say, look, there is empathy, there is ideation, there is prototype, but let's not do that. Let's not do empathy. Let's not do prototype. Let's think or let's experience. So even, even the very thing, this very, it's very tiny thing to tell the students, let's experience and not think, okay? So the experience can be corporeal rather than mental. So for example, if you would like to do this process only by moving or, you know, like by trying to have other experiences. I'm, I'm trying not to sound like, um, like too bizarre because I'm not going there. So it's not like a new age and I'm not there at all. It has like, we have, we have a good notion today. Just take, for example, the internet. So, you know, we know that the, the common wise is much, much bigger than the wisdom of one person. So we use these logics all the time. We are just not aware. So for me, the very first thing to do is to look at this design process model, design thinking model, and to unthink, not to act and not to follow the path. And uh, actually, if we, I can, we, we can do another meeting and, and you know, discuss ways of, of doing that. Uh, and I think it, is, it should still be developed. I don't have solutions for everything. So I'm trying my best. I'm like taking from psychology methods and I'm taking methods from Buddhism 
and I'm taking uh, me uh, methods from uh, positive psychology a lot and from like various from, from philosophical texts. So I'm trying to, to take everything and to just bring it to, to the space to allow it just to be. So I'm not sure I, I answered it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asaf. Uh, officially, we'll, we'll be closing in, uh, since we have this tough 60 minute rule set up at the beginning. So we'll close in about three minutes. So there's one official question, but uh, then there's the official ending and we stop the recording, but then there's still some time. And I learned that Asaf and, and Digal and uh, Daniel will have some time more. So Nadia, uh, Nadia Witte, you're raising your hand as well as Natalie. <laughs> Fantastic. Asaf, um, one question responding directly to what you just said. So is there a point where you use the unthinking and where another one where you use the structured design thinking? How, do, how do you differentiate? Um, so again, uh, it's, a, it's an excellent question. And let me tell you something. When I took Buddhist courses in the universities, and I please let me repeat, I'm not talking about New Age, okay? So I'm talking like like the real texts of the Buddhism, like Theravada, like the um, the sutras of the Buddha. So I remember myself approaching to my teacher and say, you know, he's talking so much, and half of it is illogical. So he he says things and then he contradicts himself. So what do you want me to do with that? And, and she said, don't think like a Western, <laughs> think like an Indian, right? So don't think like that. So she said, you know, this is okay that it is paradoxical. This is okay that it is not logical. So for me, the very starting point is that, you know, that you, you can tell to yourself if you're using this, this process that you can have like, for example, two contradictory opinions which is a very, it's, it's, it's not logical to have, right? You can't say this design is good and it's not good. You need to explain it's good in this and it's good in that, or it's bad in this and it's good in that, right? But we know, like we know from quantum theory, we know from network theory that things can actually be dead and alive. We know it from the skin. The skin has like cells which are dead and alive and they keep moving. So what seems to be like a layer is actually a vibrant space. So I think the, the main problem, and this is, this is what the philosophical issue here, is that we are wasting too much time in thinking what is correct and trying to achieve these targets because we, are, we have a very clear notion of progress, of developing, of innovation. So I've just finished an MIT course on innovation entire course, like three months of course on innovation without even one word about ethics, about society, about Anthropocene, about anything, about emotions, nothing, just, you know, very strict like that. So this is okay. I'm not saying it's wrong. This is absolutely fine. We need those people as well. I would like to present a different approach. So I hope it's, I'm not sure I'm, I'm really answering your questions, <laughs> but I'm, I'm trying. I'm struggling here. <laughs> Thanks. That was on time. That was my my ugly time timer here saying that we are at six sixty minutes. <laughs> thank thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Daniel, uh, for also for setting that up here together with Yigal and Asaf. A uh, highly interesting session. I'm I'm really happy that we have you now on board as as GDTA members and can do lots of philosophical discussions and actually move the ethical thinking and the value based thinking of the design thinking community further on together with you. I think you are uh, contributing quite intensively. Thank you very much for all of you joining here uh, today for our last session in 2020. That is the first session we did so far where we did not talk about Corona from the very first moment, not at all. I'm just using the word now, first time, and uh, I'm happy with that. So we are, we are all dealing with the pandemic in somehow good or bad way. 
um, and uh, also with uh, interestingly enough uh, with in a west in the western world with uh, uh, it's less efficient the reaction than in the eastern world in the asian world it is probably worth to analyze that also in an, in, a, in another round uh, together with our friends from asia um, so um, i wish all of you uh, a great end of the year uh, for those of you who celebrate something like Christmas or <laughs> celebrate it in a, in a good way. I hope we don't have to move the start of the new year uh, towards the middle of next year. I think we can do it at, the, at January 1st. I, at least I hope and I hope we can do this in a healthy way. And uh, I wish all of you a great end of the year and we see you hopefully back i think i think the next session is planned steffi am i right for january the 19th um so and far, the yes. time is not set the yeah. day is set the time is depending on the participants so if you get a person from australia this person is awake and maybe others are sleeping and uh, so i'm looking forward to see all of you again then so that is the end of the official part stay negative, think positive, um, and spread ideas.